as, as Andrew said, I'm a general practitioner in Hamilton, which of course all of you will know as the cultural and academic centre of New Zealand. Now, a little bit like Kim, um, our previous speaker said, I'm actually not going to say anything around sport, in particular nothing about the Bledisloe Cup or the Rugby World Cup and where it currently resides. Um, I, I do also want to applaud the RDA in terms of having a conference like this because many people who become involved in, in um, leadership positions in medicine simply kind of gravitate that way rather than it being a, hey, this is interesting, this is exciting, and this is what I want to do. And to have a conference like this for you people at the beginning of your medical careers, I think is quite exceptional. And that, sh to me, shows the leadership. Um, who's familiar with this painting? A uh, few people. Good. It's one of my favorite pieces of art. It was uh, painted in 1890 by the, name, by the guy by the name of Luke Fields. Uh, and there's a lovely story behind it. Um, his son, who was a toddler at the time, um, died of tuberculosis, as of course most people did back in those days. But what struck Luke about the, uh, the, the, the death of his son was the doctor who came to look after his son. And as you can see there, there's a doctor uh, with care, compassion, and worry. And at the same time, uh, the doctor knew that there was little or nothing that he could do uh, for the case in front of him. Compare that to a more modern view of medicine. Now, apparently, amongst all the machines that go beep, there is a patient. <laughs> Uh, and uh, what is interesting about this is that complexity and technology and teamwork are the vital components that are going in here, as well as care, compassion, and worry. The difficulty is that much of medical education and much of the culture of medicine is still back in the 1890s, and we still clearly don't have our mind around the complexity and the teamwork that is required um, for a modern medical scenario. And of course, the difficulty becomes that mistakes happen. And when they do, they become very public. So not only is there harm to the patients and the loved ones from medical error, there is that awful, awful harm that occurs to the medical professionals and the medical professionals uh, who are involved in care. So, no medical professional, apart from the very occasionally occasional Harold Shipman, goes to work with the intent of patient harm happening. And yet it happens way too often. So if you look at what the research is, uh, the Utah and Colorado studies, and the Harvard studies in the, in the UK and in, in the US uh, were some of the first ones that looked at death rates from medical error. And they estimated the error, uh, the, the fatality rate in the US was somewhere between 45,000 and 90,000 people per year. This was as a direct result. It wasn't a contributing factor, it was a direct result. Uh, and Kim talked about the study that was uh, undertaken in Australia, which came out with almost the same conclusions in terms of, of the rates of fatalities. And then Peter Davis, uh, sociologist in Christchurch and um, uh, partner to Helen Clark, repeated the same study in Christchurch. And the results were almost identical. So if you extrapolate all of that into fatality rates, you get somewhere above 100 to 150 people in New Zealand who die every year as a direct result of medical error. Now, we've heard about the um, airline industry and the analogies. If Air New Zealand crashed a 737 uh, once a year, nobody would, would fly Air New Zealand. It would be considered an absolute disaster. Um, I'm going to talk about changes. This is uh, an interesting graph of um, uh, where we are in terms of our medical workforce. And really what it says, this is the peak medical workforce in 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2012. 
Um, uh, as you can see from that, our workforce is aging and aging quite rapidly. So, you know, the, the, the floor becomes open for new people to come in. Not only that, but in my own profession as a general practitioner, there is a huge gap of younger people coming into the profession and potentially taking leadership uh, positions in, in, the, in the profession. This means that old trustees like myself and Andrew are going to be disappearing over the next 10 to 15 years um, and new people starting to come in. And this is where your role is going to be. Uh, who here qualified in 2015? 2014? Uh, 2013? Good. Um, on the left, uh, I, I qualified in 1985. On the left is the 1985 Toyota Corolla. On the right is the 2015 Toyota Corolla. Now, let me tell you, way back in 1985, the, the car on the left was really stylish. <laughs> and most of them actually had air conditioning. <laughs> Uh, so, my first message is this, your time has come to be involved. Who works at Auckland Hospital? Uh, the smattering of people. Okay, so this is your um, uh, Chief Medical Officer, Margaret Wiltshire. Now, if you look at the job description, none of this is, all of this is available uh, in the public domain. Everything that I talk about is actually available in the public domain. And you look at her job description, clinical network development, patient safety. Uh, professional accountability. This is clinical governance. Anyone here from Gisborne or has worked in Gisborne or has been a student in Gisborne? Yes, good one. Um, yes, they too look at um, clinical governance, responsible for improving quality and participating in quality improvement. All staff, all staff. Um, this is from Nelson Marlborough. Anyone from there? Yeah. Uh, and and they, they call it clinical governance. Uh, and indeed, even in the private sector, this is the White Cross Network, they clearly talk about clinical governance. So this is my second message. Um, a lot of these structures are in fact already in place, which is good. Here's another thing that's in the public domain though. Uh, this comes from a report um, from a medical council visit to a particular hospital. Uh, and the uh, CMO has responsibilities in terms of looking at the governance of teaching of RMOs. And as you can see there, the acting chief medical officer advised he was not undertaking this role, nor had he delegated this role. Yeah, that's a problem for training. Uh, and so, rather than we know about clinical governance and have structures in place, I think mostly is, is the term to use there. Uh, 2003 report from the UK. So this was of about 270 trusts in secondary care, not primary care. So a trust in secondary care is a little bit like uh, a DHB, but of course the UK is a touch bigger than us. So they got 270 rather than the 20 that we have. And it, uh, it, it spoke about some very interesting things. Uh, and in particular, what were the barriers for clinical governance coming into their institutions? And this is what they were, lack of resources, the culture, and lack of strategy or process. So I'm gonna unpick these a little bit. The first one, um, uh, lack of resources. And really what they were meaning here is insufficient doctors, the administrative support, uh, other competing agendas, and excessive workload. In the, U uh, in the UK at the moment, they're having some major issues. Uh, Jeremy Hunt, <laughs> who's the equivalent of the um, uh, health uh, minister, uh, is trying to institute a whole bunch of changes. And in fact, really what he wants is to increase the services across weekends. Uh, but he doesn't want to pay any more money. Uh, and so, in fact, he's asking people to work harder uh, for less. Um, there are some huge issues in terms of workload, and my guess is that a fair amount of you have seen um, a position like this of uh, trolleys up and down the corridors. Yeah, yeah, 
you know, workload and uh, staffing is a complex, complex issue. It doesn't have, I don't think, its only solution in terms of increasing the amount of people who are working uh, or, or necessarily paying them more. I think that actually means working slightly differently. Um, we've, we've heard a couple of comments this morning around how much waste there is in medicine. And to me, this is a clinical governance problem. Um, I've, I've been working with a group called Choosing Wisely. And Choosing Wisely uh, started off in the US when they recognized that our fee-for-service payment model is creating huge uh, excess of medical procedures, of uh, orthopedic procedures that don't need to be done, of um, urological procedures, etc., etc. And uh, some good research by uh, various groups has been uh, taken by Choosing Wisely just to demonstrate where the loss in our medical systems are. Now, I would put to you, I don't actually think that we would be any better than that. This is US figures, but um, I don't think that we are any better than that. And this is a major issue. If you have people having procedures that they don't need, not only is that in incredibly wasteful for limited budgets. It opens the, the patient up to complications, um, morbidity, uh, and mortality, and it opens doctors up to risk. This is not good. The other problems around excessive procedures uh, is these things. Um, we get tired. Uh, and this is kind of one of the focuses in the NHS, and I, I think it's one of the focuses that the RDA is taking at the moment. And it, if you look at what's happening in the NHS and the arguments that are being made, you know, the excessive workload that people have is causing major problems. And, and as this slide clearly shows, and I think that we would all resonate with, tired doctors make mistakes. In fact, if I think clinically of the mistakes that I have made uh, in my medical career, almost always I was too busy at the time um, or I was really tired at the time. Now, I remember, this is way back in about 1986, 1987, uh, went overseas to London and worked in some of the South London hospitals. So I was working in some hospitals that had a one and two roster for their junior staff. So that meant uh, on the good weeks you worked 70 to 80 hours, on the bad weeks you worked 120 hours. Yeah, that anybody could think that a doctor is safe at 120 hours is just beyond my imagination. And yet, this is what happened. This was what was considered normal. It's also a sign that medical culture is changing. And I'm going to talk quite a lot about culture uh, because we've heard it from our speakers beforehand, and I think it is one of the most critical and important things that is happening in medicine, and in particular around clinical governance. So, other competing agendas as being a, an, an issue. This is a government report uh, in terms of DHBs and DHBs' performance. It's shorter stays in the emergency department. Well, you know, we all know how easy it is to gain shorter stays in the emergency department. And um, th there's a, a person working in a unit that I work in in Auckland. I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, this person uh, spent some time as a junior doctor in the ER in Scotland. And, and they were given a four-hour wait in ED. Uh, and she said, well, you know, it's actually just easy. You fire them off to whatever ward that doesn't really want them and isn't appropriate. And you meet your targets. It's really easy. And she said, it's also very dispiriting. You don't actually practice medicine. You just barrel people off anywhere that you can to get them out of the emergency department and meet your targets. So right in the middle of shorter stays in the emergency departments um, is a myriad of, of other things going on. Now, I don't for a minute suggest that we should not be measuring things, but it's how we measure things that are becoming important. And also, if your focus is on getting people out of an emergency department, 
what's happening to the quality of care. And that's one of the difficulties about when we measure things. We must be really careful of unintended consequences that have direct result of the quality of clinical care. A general practice, my own specialty, is uh, no different. This is from a government report on performance of PHOs. And again, you have these ranks. Increased immunization, better health for smokers to quit, uh, etc. And, you know, <laughs> it's very visible uh, of the people who are ranked at the bottom. I think this is useful information. But, you know, it sh people or organizations should not be hit over the head because, again, you can bury an enormous amount of things if all you're focusing around is meeting targets. And, and as I said, the difficulty is that this displaces activities and attention that you could be spending around safety systems and better systems of healthcare. So that brings me to my third point. There must be space to have effective clinical governance. You cannot take a really busy person, add on extra things, and expect that this is going to be done to a high standard. It doesn't happen. Culture, behavior, or attitudes of staff or organization. I think that this is the crucial little bit. As I said, we have the structures already in place in most of our institutions. This guy, Peter Drucker, is quite famous. Uh, if you look at Japan and what happened uh, from the Second World War onwards, clearly in the Second World War, Japan was absolutely devastated. Its cities were in ruins, its economy was in absolute tatters. And then what happened uh, over the next 50 to 60 years? It emerged as a powerhouse of uh, industrial efficiency. And this guy, Peter Drucker, was part of that. This is one of his famous comments, culture eats strategy for breakfast, and it really does. Um, a couple of our speakers this morning talked about um, the Bristol Babies uh, catastrophe uh, that happened, which was a grossly excessive mortality rate from pediatric cardiac surgery. Uh, the guy who finally blew the whistle was an anesthetist who was uh, providing anesthetic services for the pediatric cardiology uh, uh, department. Uh, his name was Stephen Bowman, uh, and he brought to the attention the substantial, excessive mortality of children going through the department and having uh, cardiac surgery. He could no longer work in the UK as a result of him bringing this issue to the attention of authorities. He could not find work after he did that, and he had to move to Australia. And it became very uh, prominent uh, in the area of patient safety and, and safety systems in uh, hospitals. But, you know, I hope and I believe that most of the time we are moving on in terms of our culture. We are slowly developing a better and better culture around some of these issues. This is um, a, a painting of a, a battle that occurred in 1756. So the English and the French were at war, as they were for hundreds of years. Uh, and the English were soundly defeated. And they said to the Admiral, who oh, didn't do a particularly good job. And the French Admiral <laughs> said this, in this country, it is wise to kill an Admiral from time to time to encourage the others. I think that that used to be the way that medicine was. And certainly, when I go back to 1986, 1987, 1988, when I was a junior doctor, it was like this. I do see that things are changing. They're not changing as anywhere near as fast as I would like to see them change, but they are changing. Uh, this is uh, an RDA report. I guess most of you have seen this. Most? Yep. Publicly available. Um, which I find absolutely fascinating. Uh, so again, I, I show you all of this is publicly available. Um, this is bullying in New Zealand hospitals. And uh, again, this is valuable information, although there are some caveats. 
um, as, as Andrew said earlier on, a sharp correction is not necessarily bullying. And there are various definitions of bullying that, that do have to be used. However, it is still really interesting information. I do know, if you look at the hospital right at the top, Hatton Valley, I do know that over the last six months, some substantial changes have occurred as the result of good clinical governance uh, to rectify many of the problems that they recognized going on in their hospital. And I actually personally have no doubt that if you run the survey again next year, that you would find that hospital way down the list. Uh, and again, this is good leadership. This probably comes as no surprise from your own, uh, <laughs> from your, <laughs> from your own report that surgeons are right at the top. I was at a conference last week in Melbourne, and one of the speakers was a health reporter who had been involved in uh, kind of investigative journalism into health for a number of years. And she made this comment. She said, some specialties in medicine are far more hierarchical than the army. It makes the army decision making look like a democracy over a cup of tea and cucumber sandwiches. <laughs> and I think that that's a huge issue. We do have a highly hierarchical environment. This is not good. Um, these types of structures do not lend themselves readily to people at the bottom telling the people at the top, what is in fact going on. I'm going to come back to that right at the end. But at the same time, in surgery, things are changing. David Waters, who is uh, chair of the uh, Australasian College of Surgeons, uh, you know, to me, this is, this is good. This is strength. This is leadership. When he stands up and he says, we have been getting it wrong for a long time. And what he's doing, he's recognizing the huge cost, not just to the trainees, but because the medical, the quality of medical services in institutions where bullying is rife is lower. He's apologizing to the patients who suffers from a culture of bullying in the institutions. I think that this is good, and this is clear leadership. This is from the American Psychological Association, and I, I like it because they talk about power and powerlessness. And Right on the front page, they talk about interns, uh, their equivalent of junior doctors. And, and I like that. And you know, the most highly stressed occupations marked by the need to respond to others' demands and timetables with little control over events. It's that old thing, being held responsible for something over which you have little or no control. That's a just awful, awful situation, and I'm sure most of you are thinking back over the last few years as to times when you are exactly in that position. It doesn't always have to be like this. This is, I think, one of the most iconic photographs uh, that I've seen in the last 20 or 25 years. The woman's name is Alicia Evans. She's a 35-year-old nurse from New York City. Uh, she was uh, watching over a period of months where so many uh, African Americans were being killed by police, unarmed African Americans being killed by police. So she decided she needed to do something. She heard about this peaceful protest that was going to occur in Baton Rouge. She flew from New York to Baton Rouge to take part in a peaceful protest. And in the middle of this peaceful protest, the police suddenly said, no, you're not going to protest, you're not going to say anything. We're going to arrest you if you do. Isn't that just a, the essence of grace and power? I just love that photograph. She was arrested. She spent 24 hours in prison um, and uh, was released with no charges. So that brings me to my fourth point. Um, the culture must be right. You must be able to speak up. The culture must encourage clinical governance. Fourth one, uh, sorry, third, um, lack of strategy, process, or coordination uh, in the organization. I like this one. What if, and I know this sounds cookie, we communicated with the employees. <laughs> um, really 
what we're saying is, you can have um, all the ideals, you can have the strategies, you can have the culture. That's not quite enough. You need mechanisms as well. And most of, one of the most crucial mechanisms is that of communication. So the structures must be right if you're going to have good clinical governance. When I was at your stage in, in my medical development, this is very much how I felt. You know, there were people around who seemed to be lower down the rigid hierarchy than I, and there were a hell of a lot of people above me in the rigid hierarchy um, that I existed in. And it would seem to me that you slowly made your way from you know, training intern to house officer to senior house officer to registrar type, type stuff. Um, but you know, you were made very aware where you were in this hierarchy. Uh, and I can quite understand that you probably feel that this is where you sit. Well, I've got a different model for you. I think that you should be like this. I think that you should think of yourselves as a spider in the middle of a cobweb. Yes, <laughs> stand <to> silence. <laughs> Uh, but this is why, you know, in your, in your hospitals, there are many structures around that you can look at and become actively involved at. Yeah, education <coughs> training committees are emergencies, mortality and morbidity meetings, risk committees, and the list goes on. And, it's, and I'm sure if you're thinking about your own hospitals, uh, you can think of and, and add two or three others that probably come with slightly different names. But in fact, a lot of them are around the same thing. You know, safe patient care, good outcomes. And on the other side, you've got this, where you are as a RMO or as a registrar. Uh, you've got your day-to-day -day ward experience. You've got errors that occur that you see all the time. And a lot of these errors will be exactly the same errors that have occurred before. And when you talk with your colleagues, oh, gee, you know, my... Um, uh, instruction to do this on that ward never happened. And somebody says, oh gosh, yeah, that exactly the same thing happened to me last week. The recurring patterns of these areas is actually a really interesting thing. Systems that don't work. Uh, you know, I was on a hospital visit um, to a, a hospital to look at their training, and one of the RMOs said, our major problem is when we're on call for psychiatry because we know that the, the resuscitation trolley uh, is going to be almost bare of all the things that we want. And we know that the defibrillator usually doesn't work. You know, um, uh, how that never made its way up to uh, the, the top levels of the organization is a failure of clinical governance. There weren't the structures there that would allow all of this information to be collected and collated in a way to make patient care safe and to make your work environment safe. Uh, this is my last <laughs> slide. Uh, and I remember, <laughs> this is kind of so accurate from, from my time as, a, uh, as, as an RMO. I particularly like that bladder of steel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as, uh, and a, and a, a fair comment is, is that somebody said, never do, as an RMO, never do anything on a full bladder or an empty stomach. And I think, you know, as a piece of advice, that's actually a rather good one. But, you know, my, my message is for you, uh, is, is very much around, don't be inactive. If you're looking at a dynamic system, anything that's inactive becomes irrelevant. So the first bit is, don't be irrelevant. The second bit is, you must become involved, and I really encourage you to do that. You are the people who will be taking over from the grey-haired and the hair-challenged people that you see here in the room. And it is up to you to decide the culture of medicine that you want. Thank you.